So first off, let me do the, of course, the obligatory selfie with y'all, okay? So no, <laughs> no photo bombing. Ready? One, two, oh, I see some money. Three. All right, perfect. First off, th thank you so much for being here, and, and, and certainly thank you for your service. The Excuse me. There's a little more annoying than this. Oh, my God. I, I, I just got started with this. No, I'm, no, I'm starting talking. To, no, right now, I'm just saying, you're fine. You're, you are the first slide. I, I haven't told them yet, but I will, I promise. No. Okay, qu quickly, hang on. Show of hands, Hunter S. Thompson, who knows who he is? Yeah, every hand in the audience went up. So, <laughs> are you happy? Okay, I will, uh, I'll, I'll be back with you, thanks. I'm really sorry about that. He wanted me to show you this. He, he, he calls me occasionally, and at least he says he's Hunter Thompson, but, but, but he, this is his favorite quote, and it is clearly one of my favorite quotes as well. And I love at the end of life when you slide in and say, Holy shit, what a ride. And this is the guy that I'm talking about. He's been dead about 10 years, so I'm not sure it's actually him who's calling, but he continues to call me, so in fact, it might be. The other kind of scary quote he had, and if you've read anything about him, it's, he does, he's kind of the start of gonzo journalism, which is kind of crazy, drug-hazed, alcohol-induced journalism. But despite that, he has some brilliant quotes. And at the edge, there's no honest way to explain it because the only people who really know where it is are the ones who've gone over it. And uh, so here's to not having to go over it. Uh, and while those are great quotes, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes, and you know this quote probably very well, it's on the website of the Pat Tillman Foundation. Uh, somewhere inside we hear a voice, it leads us in, uh, in the direction of who we wish to become, but it's up to us whether to follow it or not. And it was said by this guy, who clearly followed it, and, and, and I know I'm gonna preach to the choir uh, for the next few minutes. Um, and you all have the absolute, the fact that you're here, you have the absolute capacity to follow it, whatever it is. I started on my own kind of journey looking at this and thinking about talking about it. I, I was asked to speak to a group of Mensa people. Is before I say anything else, is anybody in here in Mensa? I, I'm not either. So when I started, it was about, I don't know, 7,500 people. And I started off saying, it was a Friday afternoon, and it was middle of summer in Phoenix, and it was jam-packed. And I said, Thank you so much for being here. Frankly, I'm shocked about how many people are so enthusiastic about the women's reproductive cycle. <laughs> which I thought was incredibly, incredibly funny. <laughs> and it got no laughs at all. And so it, it started out kind of slow. Um, but by the end of it, they kind of warmed up to me and maybe me to them a little bit. But at the end, one of them raised their hand. And now these are, as I understand it, have to be over IQ over 160 to get into men's up. So at the end of this, the guy stood up, he had a pocket protector, I swear to God, and he said, hey, this is all well and good, and we all are super excited to go out and change the world, but tomorrow when we wake up and look in the mirror, it won't be, it won't be John Shupal we see, it'll be us, and, and then what do you have to say about that? And you can feel the air just get sucked out of the room, and I thought, man, if these people who have super high IQs are having a hard time getting it together to change the world, what does that do for the rest of us? Which really is the kind of the impetus for me to start on this thing. So I started calling this reflections, this views from just over the horizon. Uh, that's me. And uh, it's really about looking ahead and beyond and trying to figure out what traits and qualities do you have today that you count in your playbook. And of all the groups I've spoken to, hands down, I've spoken to some really cool groups. You guys are by far the outliers, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. But what traits and qualities do you have, do you possess now, and what can you improve upon for the years to come? Because the studies are the people who have a five and ten year vision, if they look ahead that far, really do much better because then they have a path that they organize themselves on. And, and they all know they're not going to stay on that path. They all know they'll veer out and things will change, but they'll adapt and cope and, and, ch and change with it along the way. So I'm not original. I stole this look ahead thing from the USS uh, Stennis. The USS Stennis is a nuclear uh, powered aircraft carrier named after Senator John Stennis who had a look ahead on his desk. And it, does anybody know what inundo optimum means? Oh good, because I never took Latin either. It means the best in the world. So there's about 6,000 sailors. Anybody here I served on an aircraft carrier before I put my foot in my mouth? All right, so when I put my foot in my mouth, raise your hand and say, here's where you're an idiot. So 6,000 sailors, two nuclear reactors, they change them out after 25 years, 
They go 50, they go, this thing will be built for 50 years. Uh, they change them out every million miles, is how far the nuclear reactors can take the ship. They spend $60,000 a day on food. Uh, and the most common surgical procedure they do, this really struck me, is a vasectomy. Is we, don't do any, we don't do anything elective, but we do a lot of vasectomies, which I never really got my head around. But apparently, when you're at sea, there's an impetus to get SNP. I don't know what that impetus is, but it's there. So I invited you out and talked to a group of sailors uh, on the USS Stennis. So I boarded this thing called the Carry On Board Delivery. That's me with my hydrocephalus head. And I land, I didn't land, I was in the back screaming for dear life. Uh, and this plane that landed on the aircraft carrier, which was very cool, there's a Stennis from far away. And while in Stennis, I had to see a really lot of really cool stuff that you guys are probably so used to, it's boring. But for me, being the first time in an aircraft carrier, I mean, it was kind of badass. I mean, I really liked it. So I was got to go up and ride in the, in the bridge with Captain Matt Wetloffer, and he said, what's the coolest thing you've done so far? And I said, well, seeing all the carrier ops and the rest of the landing. He goes, no, no, he goes, wait to meet the crew. When you talk to the crew, they will be the coolest, coolest part of this aircraft carrier. Because he said the average age on it, correct me if I'm wrong, was 22 years old, all added up, is that about right? So five to 6,000 people, 22 years old, average age, all working together to move that huge ship around the world. Really impressive. So I did, and they were cool. So at the end of 36 hours, got back on, again, me, hydrocephalus head, fly, shoot off the catapult back out, again, very cool, but you're facing backwards, so you don't have quite the sensation. And on the way back, I started thinking, how does this happen? How does, how does, how does that Captain Kathleen Wetloffer get all these people to act in concert, and then how do they, in turn, work and improve their skills to hone them to such a fine degree that we that boat becomes such a huge um, stabilizing force in the, in the industry. So I thought, or not in the industry, in the country, so I started thinking, okay, what is the crucial question? And the crucial question, as I see it, is how do we break the mold to achieve things we never thought possible? What small changes can we make that have the biggest possible outcomes? Because that's, that's what our why is, right? So, is he, so I spent the last year working with a neuropsychologist um, a guy out of California, and I can't even just want to up my game. So for a year, I spent a lot of money, met with him a lot, did all his battery of tests, and, and heard what he had to think, and heard what he had to say, and it was really interesting. Um, but one of the things I learned is that our brains are hardwired to play small, to fear the future, to ignore, to delay, to resist, to stay lost in the fog. And I have to say again, out of all the groups, probably doesn't apply to you guys, but for everybody else out there, this is kind of how their brains and what they revert back to because it's comfortable. So speaking teleologically, looking at how this, why we are, the way we are, if you think about it back in the day, you know, if you venture outside your cave and there's a saber-toothed tiger out there, but you're the brave one in your crowd, you're the entrepreneurial cave person, you probably get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or clubbed by your neighbor. Well, those were the, the, that was then, I guess, and this is now. So our brains have the capacity, however, to really innovate, contribute large, play big, take risks, take the initiative. And, and it's this that has really marked the upward progression of mankind uh, throughout the millenniums. And occasionally you get beaten or eaten by the proverbial saber-toothed tiger, but, but certainly not as much as you used to. So speaking of ROI, what are the smallest changes that you can make in the near term that will impact the longer term and then that you can achieve the biggest outcome? Really, that's what, that's what ROI is, right? Smallest you can put in, biggest return on your investment. And that's really what you should focus on, is that middle aspect of it. So in 2015 and then beyond, where can you look ahead to? So before this last year started, I started working with this guy. He said, I want you to write down your goals for the year. And then I want you to think of them on a month-to-month -month basis, and then a week-to-week -week basis, and then a day-to-day -day basis. And you don't have to be you know, an engineer about the thing. But if you start thinking in that sort of term and say, all right, I know where I want to get to here. So one of the things I do is I try to go back to school every 10 years. Sometimes I go a little shorter, sometimes I go a little longer. But last year I did this Six Sigma thing. And I knew at the start of the year I wanted to finish it by the end of the year. And I knew that I was woefully inadequate in a lot of things, math being one of them. So I went back and started looking at some math to try to figure out, okay, what math do I need to do the statistics to get through the Six Sigma? And that's just one kind of poor example of it. But if you start looking ahead, what can you do that impacts other people? Well, certainly respect everyone you meet, forgive where you can, where you should, paying attention to smaller details that lead to the biggest outcomes. For example, reading a new book every week was one of mine. Uh, being, hard, being kind to the hard to be kind crowd. I work in a very busy trauma center in downtown Phoenix, and we see a lot of indigents, and we see a lot of people who are on drugs and alcohol and all sorts of things. And sometimes when they spit at you, they're, they're kind of hard to be kind to. 
Uh, but those are the ones who kind of need kindness the most. And so they, okay, I, I can up my game on that. But at the end of the day, what can you do? Small incremental things to change the world. I mean, that's what I think that's what you're here for. That's certainly what the Tillman um, scholarship is all about. So for me, one small thing I did, well, they started just making a checklist every day, and I'm a checklist, a Talgwani checklist manifesto sort of person, and they kind of did it anyway, but I did it more mentally uh, previously, and I'm sure I forgot a lot of things. So I started writing things down, and those checklists really corresponded to this one-year, five-year, ten-year plan, knowing full well that in five years I'll probably be living in Tibet as a Buddhist. I mean, who really knows? But, but at least along the way, I will have accomplished some things I wanted to, wanted to check off. So what can you do on a day-to-day -day basis, small incremental changes, so you don't forget the small but important things to have the biggest outcome at the end of it? So a ways back, I started writing this series of books called Ingredients of Outliers. And I've, been, I've had a kind of a cool background, and only in the sense that I've made every mistake in the book and, and survived. And I'll show you, I almost didn't survive a few of them, but I survived, at least in some respects, most of them. And and I never really had a mentor along the way. When I was a kid, I wasn't smart enough to go out and find somebody who could kick me in the rear end and then put their arm around me when it was indicated and, and coach me up. And, and clearly, I, clearly I needed one. But over the years, I've been cataloging these traits of people who are really at the top of their game um, and trying to say, okay, what is it about them? And you, Pat Tillman is certainly one of them. And what is it about them when you meet them and when you see them interact with others that sets them apart from just the kind of the average workaday person in the world. And you know, I came up with about 10 or 12 of them, and they kind of all had most of them. Not, they didn't all have all of them, but they all had most of them. So the first two books were talking about what these traits are, and then the rest of the series goes discipline by discipline in interviewing these people who I've met or I've known for years who have these traits and then hearing about their story. So that was the genesis of all this. So what's an outlier? I kind of stole it from Malcolm Gladwell. I mean, in the sense of somebody who stands out from the, uh, the statistical norm is kind of how we define an outlier, at least statistically. But for me, it was defined as someone who starts at excellence and kind of goes up from there. And it's these people that I was talking about that I that I kind of just tried to distill some of their traits from. So, I mentioned I practiced emergency medicine, and I've noticed over the years, and so I've, this is. 30 years and 17 days ago was my first day in the air. Um, because July is when you start, so it's pretty easy to figure out. 30 years and 17 days I've been practicing emergency medicine. I know I only look like I'm 35, but it's, it's, it's not true. <laughs> and it's been kind of, it's been amazing because I've seen people at their absolute worst, in the worst time of their life, and at their absolute best, maybe even during the worst time of their life. And in, it's, there, it's both, it's, it's everything about the human condition you see in an emergency department. And one of the things that struck me the most is occasionally, five times maybe in 30 years, I'll see somebody at the end, and, and they know they're at the end, and they know they're dying, and they know there's nothing you can do for them. And as they're about to die, um, in their DNR, as they're about to die, they have this look on their face. And I started calling it the if-only look. And, it, and, and when you see it, it's incredibly disturbing because you know, and they know, and you know they know it, that they're going through their head thinking of all the things that if only they would have fill in the rest of the blank. And I saw the sign, and, and this is it. It's the person who you are meets the person you could have become if only. And I told myself, what, 30 years ago probably, when I first saw this book, crap, I do not want to do that. I want to slide into the grave beat the crap yelling, holy shit, what a ride. Um, and that's kind of what has been my motivating force ever since then. Right, wrong, or indifferent, uh, I do not want to be in my deathbed saying, if only, because that means I would have not lived up to my God-given potential, however low that bar may be. <laughs> so I've had this for good fortune to do a lot of cool things. And when I say do them, I'm mo mostly a poser. So I'm the doctor on the SWAT team. I speak at this law school and at Saturday O'Connor Law School, so I was going to sit next to her. She was, couldn't hear anything, so she kept asking me what they were saying, so I was kind of making stuff up, and that was, it was making her laugh. Um, and uh, so I met these amazing people, and this is where I started thinking, okay, what traits, are, what makes Saturday O'Connor so amazing? What makes these guys on the skids here such absolute humble badasses? There are people who fly F-35s, or people in the trauma room here up on, your, uh, up on the top left. 
And one of the one of the defining traits, and you heard this a lot, so none of this will be new. And I suspect, from what I understand, all of you have this in spades: is humility. Um, Frank Lay is a football coach, and it's my one of my favorite quotes of all time: Ego, "Egotism is the anesthetic which dulls the pain of stupidity." And I love that quote because when I hear people going on and on about themselves, I'm always thinking, you know, ego probably does truly equal one over knowledge, and it's like it's like. Um, um, Socrates, you know, the more I, the more I learn, the less I know, or the more I, the more I think I need to know. And humility of all these top of the game rock stars has been the one thing that I can say every one of them had. So how do you find it? So this is a book called Humilitas, written by an Australian minister who was also a PhD, and I love the definition: the noble choice to forgo your status and deploy your resources or use your influence in the service of others before yourself. I mean, what, what better definition of the United States military there is than that? I mean, you put yourself in harm's way for the benefit of others. I mean, the definition of humility. Ego, on the other hand, the practice of talking about oneself too much and exaggerated sense of self-importance. So let me give you a, a little example. So I had this old military plane that I've been flying for 16 years now. That's it. And, um, and I occasionally go to an air show, but generally I'll just fly it around. My son is an Air Force pilot. He, he and I have flown out of the country a couple of times, and we just had a hell of a great time doing it. And um, there's this woman who worked for me um, named Terry, and her husband Aaron was an Air Force Thunderbird. And, and Aaron, is, Aaron is a great guy, super humble, top of the game, a walking recruitment poster for the Air Force. His brother-in-law is an F-35 pilot, so brother-in-law Matt. So Matt and I were going to fly down to, to Davis Mountain and see Aaron in, the, in his plant, see Aaron perform his first time as a Thunderbird. He was number six. And um, we're getting the plane, and he had wear parachutes. And I mean, there's no way I'm jumping out of that plane unless I'm on fire. Otherwise, we're flying to the ground. I have no intention of jumping, uh, at least that I, that I have to. So I'm going through this whole procedure with Matt. I'm saying, okay, Matt. Here's how we do it. You know, pull the, blow the canopy off, yaw the plane, climb out in the wing, roll down, blah, 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 blah. Or flip the plane upside down, pull your belt off, fall out, don't deploy it. And I'm going on and on. And Matt's just going, huh? Okay, all right, now I get it. And all of a sudden it dawns on me, you know, Matt's a professional Air Force pilot. And I don't think they jump, but I don't know. So I said, Matt, have you ever, this is after like five minutes of me going through this whole procedure, and him just kind of nodding and saying, okay, and repeating stuff I said. Matt, have you ever jumped before? He goes, well, John, let me tell you, if we jump today, I'll be number 763. I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to do everything you do. And what impressed me about this whole situation much was Matt easily could have, could have fingered me for a poser. I was. I never jumped at all. I, just, I literally read the book. And where he's done it hundreds of times, 761 uh, before this. But he was humble enough that he did not have to assert that knowledge that he had, that he had so easily, and say, well, you don't need to go over this with me. I'm a professional Air Force pilot. I've, I was on the Air Force skydiving team. And I thought, what an easy, great definition of humility that is. So some humility takeaways. This has always helped me, reading the biographies of really amazing people. Because when you read about Louis Zapparini or Theodore Roosevelt, I mean, Winston Churchill, the real badasses of our history, uh, you realize that most of them we're a lot like all of you. They don't talk. They talk a lot about others. They brag up their team quite a bit because they're so proud of them, but not about themselves. Count how many times you talk about yourself during the day. It doesn't apply to you guys. Remind yourself that large egos are often a sign of insecurity, and, and I've seen that repeatedly. And where I've seen that really impact people is that insecure people are afraid to take risks because they don't want they're, they're veneer cracked. They don't want it to ever look like they are not in control. So they're really incredibly risk averse. That's something that I've noticed over the years. And finally that, it does prevent you from taking risks and taking that step into the ocean and turn it, trying out a new business idea. So speaking of new business ideas, let's talk about failure. So this is a quote by Michael Jordan. Now, in, I'm older than you guys, but in my era, and I grew up here, Michael Jordan was the king. And watching him was like watching poetry. I mean, he was so fluid. But then he has this quote, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the final shot and lost. That's Michael Jordan. I failed over and over in my life, and that's, what makes me, and that's why I succeed. And I can tell you I have made every mistake in most playbooks ever written, and I made some mistakes that you can't even imagine making, and I'll just tell, tell you about a few of them. When I was out in the aircraft carrier, you know, every time there's planes in the air, they deploy a helicopter. Um, to sit, to kind of hover alongside the plane and move along with it in case one of the air crews was, uh, one of the planes was down. They don't expect to fail, but they certainly prepare to fail just in case. 
So, well, I'll tell you this quick story. So I've owned a ton of different businesses and, and tried a lot of different things, everything from inventing the vibrating tampon to owning hot dog stands. Um, seriously. I'll tell you about the latter, not the former, because the former is kind of awkward. So the latter, I've always wanted to own a, I've always wanted to own a restaurant. So I'm from Chicago, so I thought how better it is to, I might as well start, start small, start with hot dog stands. So I bought five hot dog stands, and in, in, in Phoenix, in the winter, they killed it. But in the summer, when it's 112 degrees out, newsflash, people are not buying hot dog stands on the street corners. Point of, point of parliamentary procedure. But I had some of these hot dog stands in relatively well-traveled places, Mayo Clinic, for example, um, Home Depot. <coughs> so I went back and got a master's degree um, between 93 and 95, about the time I had these hot dog stands, and at the same time I was working night shifts in this emergency department right by ASU. I'd go to school during the day, and I'd go across the street and work in the ED overnight. And it was an MBA where you'd go all day Friday or all day Saturday. Uh, and then, you know, some online stuff and other stuff. And so one morning, it's, I'd been in class all day, worked all night, it's about 7, 6.30 in the morning, and I'm getting ready to go home, and I'm kind of bone tired by this time. And I get a call from the woman, the young lady, who was running the hot dog stand at Home Depot. She says, John, I'm not really feeling well. I'm not going to take the hot dog stand to Home Depot. I mean, this, this is, a, you know, Saturday's Home Depot. That was a big day for us. I said, are you sure? I said, I said what, what's the matter? You know, I, you know, I'm a doctor. Maybe I can help you. You can't help this. Okay. Maybe number one could have helped it, but not, and I couldn't help it. It's the former. So I go, all right. So, which is actually what it was. I, so anyway, I go back, I go to the, they're all in a hangar, I go back to the hangar, I get the hot dog stand, I pull it to Home Depot, and now it's about noon, and I am like just dragging ass. And I'm, and I'm had like, there's 20 people around me, and I'm cooking these hot dogs, and I see this guy staring at me, and I'm suddenly getting self-conscious. I mean, I grew up Catholic, and you know, like, like, the first thing I think of, of course, oh, geez, it's my zipper's down, no, that's good. <laughs> so the guy keeps staring at me, and finally comes over, and he goes, he goes, I think I know you. And I said, you don't know me. He goes, no, I... No, I've seen you before. Wait a minute. You were the doctor who stood on my foot last Friday at Tommy St. Luke's in the ER. And I'm like, oh, crap. I go, and I didn't really remember him. I go, oh, okay. And he goes, and you left some glass in it. Oh. And I go, well, that's why I'm here selling hot dogs today. So, <laughs> so that was my last day selling hot dogs. So unfortunately, it's not this sort of story where, where she, J.K. Law, gets turned down by 51 publishers. She's... She's divorced, she lived out of her car for a while, she was just really at the bottom, uh, and, and went to 51 publishers with this crazy idea of Harry Potter, and finally someone believed in her, and it took off. And when she gave the commencement address to Harvard, you know, she said, hey, failure is certainly not all that much fun, but it really brought me here today. Had I not gone to that 52nd publisher, I wouldn't be talking to you folks at Harvard, and I certainly wouldn't be the billionaire that I am today. So I love the fact that failure is just often always just one final step past what you, that your last, or success is one final step past your last failure. So some takeaways, um, call it failing fast. As long as you're failing fast, you figure it out, it's not working, you change course and move on. Every successful person, it's just that one final push that gets them from failure to success. And I always think when, it's, when I'm really struggling, I think, okay, if this was easy, everybody would do it. I mean, the fact that, the fact that you're doing it that it's worthwhile, it's a worthy cause, and that you're working your ass off for it, and it's really struggling, you kind of want it to be really difficult, because if it wasn't really difficult, then you'd have a whole crowd of people behind you trying to do the same thing. Okay, persistence. So one of my favorite pictures, the Wright Brothers, of course, the definition, the keys to persistence. So one of my favorite quotes by Calvin Coolidge, probably not the best president we've ever had, but certainly one of the best quotes we've ever had. Um, wasn't that a classic comment about about speaking in front of a crowd by, it wasn't, it was, it was uh, the gentleman who, not, not Camille, the other gentleman, and said, I'm not a very good speaker, but I have a lot of passion. I'm the opposite of Obama, I'm not a very good speaker, but I have a lot of passion. I thought, I wonder if he meant that. <laughs> nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not, nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not, unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not, the world is full of educated derelicts or failures. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved, and will always solve the problems of the human heart. Just absolutely phenomenal quote. And if you think about it through our own course, you know, if you go back to, go back to the siege of Boston uh, and, and Knox bringing the cannons from Fort Ticonderoga to defend the hills of Boston over 300 miles of frozen wilderness in the winter, 
Uh, I mean, persistence really has defined us as a country, and I think probably defined our forward progression as a human race. Um, it's simply the ability to continue uh, despite the hardship and pain. And for you folks, everybody here in the military, this is probably part of your ethos. I mean, it's probably in your DNA. So if you guys seen the movie um, about Louis Zamperini, he's, wow, he has no story. So Louis Zamperini, it's an Angelina Jolie movie. So Louis Zamperini is a guy who's a kind of, he grows up on the wrong side of the tracks. He's Italian in Southern California. He gets in a lot of fights, he's small, and his brother gets him to start running. And he becomes a phenomenal track star at USC. In fact, they, he ran the fastest quarter mile for like 17 years. Uh, they think he ran about a 406 mile on the beach in the, in the late 30s. I mean, just amazingly fast guy. So, in fact, he's in the Olympics with Jesse Owen on the boat over to the Olympics. Jesse Owen was his roommate on the boat over to the Olympics. Uh, he gains 12, he gains, he was, you know, he's a poor, poor kid. And he gains, he eats everything. He gains like 12 pounds. And he ends up not doing all that well in the Olympics. But in the book, he talks about stealing a Nazi flag and getting chased by the Gestapo uh, and bringing it back. Um, so he enlists in the, he's in college, he enlists in the Air Force, and he is a bombardier navigator, I can't remember. And they're flying a kind of a rescue mission out because the plane doesn't come back. And one of the engines in their, in their plane fails, they feather the wrong side, the plane spins into the ocean, three people survive. And one of them eats all the rations the first night, and Louis Zamperini and, the, and actually the, 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 the pilot survive. They live on a, that raft uh, for 47 days. Uh, which is a, another world record if you ever want to hold a record on something. Fighting sharks, staying straight by Japanese planes. Finally, a Japanese boat picks him up, and he spends three years in a pri two, two plus years in prison war camp getting tortured by this guy who knew he was an Olympic athlete. And I always think to myself, you know, no matter how bad of a day you're having, it was the best day of Louis Zamperini's life during that period of time. He finally gets, he finally comes back to the States and, and he's an alcoholic and he's just, he says he's a worthless drunk. That was his own description. And he goes to Billy Graham and finds God and whatever he did to turn his life around and literally lived until a year ago or so, uh, really talking to, talking to youth about, about staying out of trouble and, and, you know, setting the world on fire. So if you guys know the story of Ernest Shackleton, so Shackleton on this boat, the endurance, tries to go to the South Pole and get stranded on the ice for, for effectively two years that they were on, on an island called Elephant Island or on this ice cap and survived. And every day they had no hope of rescue. Every day they just persisted on and persisted on. And again, when I'm struggling, when I'm whining to myself, I think, you know, Louis Zamperini, Ernest Shackleton, there's all sorts of people who have had it far worse than I ever will have. And they always find solace in that perspective that, you know, man up, Mary, this is, this is nothing compared to what other people have endured. So some takeaways for me, uh, Winston Churchill, all-time hero, never, 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 and nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except the convictions for honor and good sense, never yield to force the apparently overwhelming might of your, en uh, overwhelming might of your enemy. Um, so if you're not afraid to fail, if your ego will let you take some risks and you persist, the, the, really the world is yours. You know, what I told my son and daughter growing up is, if you show up with a great attitude, a little bit of a game plan in, in, in it to win it, you're ahead of about 99% of the population who doesn't just think like that yet. So one of the things I've seen over the years is in trauma situations and when people are dying, people's angst goes up. And I, when I was a resident and a medical school a student, I got to watch how people respond to this because I was, I was in training. So when the general surgeons would come down, they would scream and yell and throw stuff and do all these crazy things. And there was this woman who was an attending, uh, so she's probably about six years ahead of me, and her name was Denise Fligner, and she was about this tall and about 100 pounds soaking wet, and she chain smoked, and she even chain smoked in the emergency department. That's how long ago it was when I practiced. And I'd watch the outcomes of patients when she was working versus when, the, when one of the general surgeons ran the trauma codes. And it was back in the day when we'd open everybody's chest in the emergency department, blunt or penetrating trauma. I mean, it was right out of kind of the Vietnam era, although it was past that sort of medicine. But no matter what was happening and some bad stuff, Denise would never raise her voice. The worse it got, the quieter she talked. And it always very impacted me because I watched how it affected other people. She just never lost her cool. So consequently, no one around her lost her cool. And when they did, she would talk quieter. So they had to listen to her, and they had to keep their mouth shut cannily. Um, and I really took a lot away from that. So, you know, I, I do my level best never, never to raise my voice, never to lose it. And I'm certainly not perfect at it. 
uh, and I'm certainly not like as good as Denise was, but I took a lot away from that, that if you can remain as Marcus Aurelius says, like a promontory of the sea against which the waves continually beat, it both itself stands uh, and about it those are stilled and quieted. Uh, and it's just a phenomenal quote. Um, so when things do go bad, like the hot air balloon or the spear in the rear end, um, you have composure and steadiness of mind under those circumstances. Now, you guys know who this is? So that's Osler. So that's, there's four fathers of medicine, and I'm sure there's some mothers of medicine too, but they're probably the four fathers of medicine, uh, Osler, Halstead, Kelly, and Welch. So um, Halstead was a guy who was, started really local anesthetic and hand washing. So he was using, he did, he took his mother's gallbladder out on his kitchen table in the 1800s uh, and saved her life. He was using cocaine as a local anesthetic, and then he started using it, then he started taking it because at the time no one knew how much how addictive it was. He ultimately did, and then weaned himself off cocaine with morphine. But, but it was a but it, it, you know we all laughed. Oh yeah, yeah, good business plan there, buddy. <laughs> so digressing a little bit on that business plan. So one of the things I get to do is I get to work with our SWAT team in Phoenix, and and I'm not the one kicking on the door. I'm the one hiding behind the van generally. But they're a great group of men and women, and we go out, they see some amazing things. So on one particular call, there was this guy who had a pretty good business plan. He would dress up in tactical gear, and he would rob drug dealers of their guns and cash and drugs. And you kind of, when you think about it, you know, you go, you're in business school. That's not a bad business plan, except he would kill them. And that raised the ire of the police department. Had he not been killing them, no one would have cared, I think. But anyway, he was killing them, and that got everybody's attention. So the SWAT team gets called to go down and get this guy. So 18 people, 18 guys, dressed in all black gear in three vans, go down to his house in Maricopa. And Maricopa was this kind of almost, it was a brand new town in, in outside of Phoenix, but no one lived there because it was after the crash, except he was living with his girlfriend. So as we're driving up, we had a, they had a radio call in the van, and they said, hey, um, we just got a call from the address you're hitting that this guy's slapped around his girlfriend. The neighbor was calling, and they're all screaming, and people are getting slapped and stuff. So the sergeant goes, well, don't send any police cars there because we are literally, like, driving down the street. So the second he puts on the radio, the three bands pull up, 17 guys was out, not me, 17 people go out, blow the doors off, rake the windows, drag the out on the door, throw ass on the ground, handcuff them. And I remember sitting in the van laughing, going, Man, that neighbor must be thinking, God, they take domestic violence pretty damn seriously. <laughs> so anyway, so back to Osler. So he is, he goes from Penn to Hopkins, and he's the dean of medicine there, and he's the first person who brought residents on rounds in front of patients. But he had this great speech called the Quantumatus, and it was a speech he gave to the Penn medical students as he left, and it meant imperturbability. And I'll just read a couple of quotes from it because it really is striking to me. In the first place, he said, the physician or surgeon, no quality takes rank with imperturbability, and I propose for a few minutes to direct your attention to this essential bodily virtue. Perhaps I may be able to give those of you who it has not yet developed during the critical scenes of the past month a hint or two of its importance, possibly a suggestion for its attainment. Imperturbability means coolness and presence of mind under all circumstances, calmness and storm, clearness of judgment in moments of grave peril, immobility, and impassiveness. And he goes on to talk about how important it was for physicians and really for everybody just not to lose their shit with it when it gets bad because no good, no good comes from it. And if you just walk around, not that I walk around Walmart all that often, but you walk around Walmart sometimes or the grocery store and you see people just going off on other people. And I always think, what possible good is it doing you to lose your temper at some poor person who has no control over whatever malady that you may think you're facing? It does zero good. And things like medicine and law and... and and law enforcement and certainly in the military, I can't imagine maybe during training when, when my son's being yelled at by his instructor pilot, he probably deserves it, but I can't imagine why that can be, why that ever works. And so imperturbability of quantum modest has always struck with me uh, of its importance. So some takeaways, it never works. People never perform their best when they're being screamed at. You know, when all else fails, don't lose control of your own emotions. There, you guys know who Viktor Frankl is? So Viktor Frankl is an incredible, incredible physician, psychiatrist. He loses his whole family in Nazi prison camps during World War II, during the Holocaust. And he got, and he got out of there and said, look, they could, they could do anything they wanted to me, but they could never take away my ability to respond. I get to choose how I respond. So no matter what you do to me, I get to respond how I, my reaction is my own. 
And so when someone says, I'm sorry I made you feel that way, my first response, and it sounds kind of a smart ass, is you can't make me feel anything. I, I can choose to let you bother me or, or sad, happy, whatever, but you can't make me feel that way. Because I always think of Victor Frank, a boy, if he loses his entire family and everybody's there with, and they can't make him feel a certain way, if he can do it, you know, I can certainly do some small fraction. Because I think at the end of the day, stress reveals and brings out character, and unfortunately, sometimes it's flaws. So preparation, I and mean, we're almost timed out here, I think, almost. Always preceded by un, uh, un, uh, spectacular preparation. So, as I mentioned, I, I like to fly. So this is a friend of mine. Uh, this is a hangar I have, and this was his plane. And that is a 1940 Cessna 190. And, and this will sound kind of odd, but the night before, there's three of us dudes sitting around in a jacuzzi, uh, drinking wine, and uh, <laughs> I, I think we had, I think we had some, I'm sure we had some suits on, um, and drinking wine and talking about this plane. Now, Glenn and I, who's also a pilot, uh, we're up sitting in this cabin, just hanging out, working on some cabin I have, and Rick in his plane comes up to pick us up. He doesn't want to fly back that night, so we're, we're sitting around having a good time, and um, and three dudes in a jacuzzi, and, uh, and talking about this plane, he said, the plane is a phenomenal record, and in its day, it was kind of the citation jet of planes for private aircraft. It had one flaw, it only had one door, and if the plane crashed, and you survived the crash, if the door buckled, uh, you'd often burn to death. So, and we're just, again, just kind of chatting, get up the next morning, and, and Glenn and I are kind of arguing, I said, oh, Glenn, you sit in the front seat, I've got more tail there every time, and you have, no, you sit in the front seat, whatever. So I get in the front seat, so I'm in the right, rip the piles in the left, lens in the back seat. And, and we fill the full of all sorts of crap to fly back from the cabin. And on takeoff roll, and it's about a 6,000 foot airport and about a 4,000 foot runway, so it's not that long, and takeoff roll, Rick loses control of the plane. So that's a plane about probably 90 seconds after impact. So we impact this hangar, Glenn, knowing we're gonna impact the hangar, pops the door open. So he had this mental checklist that he went through in his head, and I, and I often think, had I been in the back seat, would I have had the presence of mind, you know, I'd probably say, like, holy shit, to pop the door open, but Glenn did. Now, I give Glenn a lot of shit because he left me and Rich in the plane as it was uh, setting on fire, and I said, all I saw was your ass and elbows running down the runway. <laughs> but that's a different story. So the funny parts of all this is we're all fine. I had a little neck, the grass is on fire, and I was right, really getting to the point of peeing on the grass with the fire out. And that's how, that's how fast it went up. So Rick is in the front seat, he breaks his back. I pull him out of the, in the insides of all this array. I pull him out and leave my handprints on his upper arm. So I lay him next to the plane and he ultimately broke his back, but he's an inch shorter, but he'll be okay. So, but I've got to get my computer out of the plane because it's, you know, it's your whole life. So I'm throwing all this shit out of the plane and the fire's getting hotter and hotter and hotter, and this guy walks around that hangar there that she the edge of, and this old guy looked like Moses, and he walks on the hangar, and he goes, oh my God! And I go, get a, I said, I called 911, they're on their way, just grab a fire extinguisher, so he scurries back, and he comes back, and he just, like the hand of God, threw him on the ground, he's lying face first, and I go, holy crap, he just had a heart attack. So I abandoned my computer, being the benevolent physician that I am, but, you know, and my computer, I walk over there, and when I do this, the whole plane explodes and blows the wings off. And so, and as it turns out, he just tripped. So, <laughs> and, the, and the funniest part was, he was probably the worst hurt out of everybody. I think he broke his nose. So the fire department comes, they put the plane out, and the three of us, you guys see wedding crashers when they're walking back to the boat, and that's how we were. So we're walking down the taxiway, dragging our suit. I didn't have a suitcase, because I got theirs out and not mine. They were dragging their suitcases. And Rick, it in shorter than he was, he goes, did you hear that big explosion? And I go, yeah. I said, my, my, I was in the plane like 10 seconds earlier. I go, he goes, yeah, he goes, that was this oxygen bottle that I had behind the pilot seat. And I go, God, that, that would have been really good to know. Now, the plane does not go high enough that you need oxygen, which I pointed out to him. He said, well, you never know. Awesome. <laughs> so then he goes, and did you hear those guns? Did you hear those pop, pop, pop when the plane was on fire? And I go, yeah, I kept hearing those. And it felt like they were going like, almost right next to me. What was that? He goes, well, I, ever, I thought if I ever crashed, wouldn't it be good to have a shotgun and some shotgun shells in there? And I said, Rick, wouldn't it have been funny if we survived the crash and the plane shoots us in the ass as we're running away from it? So that's my story in preparation. And I had little part of it other than talking about it and drinking wine with two dudes in a jacuzzi. I'm a frustrated rock and roll star. I have no musical ability at all. If I sing, you'd all run out the door. Uh, and my guitar is even worse. Um, but I've always wanted to be, I've always wanted to be Bruce Springsteen, but I'd even be this guy. So you know who this guy is? David Lee Roth? 
Okay, the, the, the song Jump. So David Lee Roth had a 600 page contract when he was doing large stadium shows. And one of the things in the clause in his contract was no brown M&Ms. I want my, a lot of M&Ms, but if there's a brown one in their thing, done. So he, he writes this book called Crazy from the Heat, and I think he was probably just crazy from the drugs, but crazy from the heat. And he was, his reputation was that he was kind of crazy. I mean, brown M&Ms really just throw him out. But he said in this book, he said, look, if there's brown M&Ms in my dressing room, I know they did not read the contract. And if they didn't read the contract, what else did they miss? And, and sure enough, in some of these large stadium shows, it, stages have collapsed because they didn't follow the proper protocol. And so when you think about Captain Sully, same thing. What does he do when the, when the flock, of, flock of geese, not the rock band, goes through the engines? Skiles has a plane, so this is my airplane, Skiles has the checklist, and they go right down the checklist, in the, which they've been prepared for and training for the, their, for years before that, and saves everybody, you know, the hero of the Hudson. So make and use checklists, they're a great way to ensure you're prepared everything. So I use them in medicine, I certainly use them in things like cooking, and certainly use them in things like flying. And it'd be as simple as just kind of sitting down, having some quiet time of meditation, thinking, what am I gonna, th what's gonna happen to me, and what am I gonna do about it when it does? And as Bobby Knight said, and you know, Bobby Knight, love him or hate him, is a great basketball coach. Uh, the key is not the will to win. Everybody has the will to win, but it's the will to prepare to win that, that really seals the deal. All right, so some takeaways. Uh, become what I call an outlier, or Malcolm Gladwell's little, def little different definition outlier. It's not really all that difficult. So if you find things that you know you're already good at and work to improve even them, and then figure out the ones that you're not so good at, and really, really continue to press forward on those, You'll become one of these people I've met over my career that are really at the top of their game. Like a Pat Tillman where he just he has this it factor that he just shines a light in any room he walks into and, and leads teams and leads his, his service, fellow service men and women uh, into action. Uh, for the good news, most people don't think like this. The, the fact that you're sitting here clearly means you're already well ahead of the game and have nothing but a huge future ahead of you. I mean, how, how could you not? You're, you've gotten this far and you've had all sorts of crazy obstacles and things that no, none of us, including myself, have ever faced. So one of my favorite phrases, gear up, raise up the landing gear, gear up whatever suit you're wearing, but it means get ready for action. And so this is a phenomenal quote that I've always loved. 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the things you did. So uh, catch a trade wins, uh, put in your sails, explore, dream, and discover. So an old Mark Twain quote. Thanks. So, I was supposed to have time for questions, so if there's questions, I'm happy to try to answer them, or anybody else can answer them. <laughs> it's that easy. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, thanks, first of all, for your comments and presentation. Um, I, I find that I agree with everything that you, you said, and that people trying to strive for self-improvement, but I always get tripped up in terms of what that actually looks like. And, and so in your research and in meeting with all of these people, I was wondering if you picked up on any particular trends, like in particular, you know, when you talk about the checklist, but you know, how does that manifest itself in everyday life? So that, that's a great question. And, and so the question is, you know, how, does this move, how do you move the ball? With all that crap you just told us, how do you move the ball forward? Is that a good summary? That's, that's my unintellectual <laughs> summary. Let, let, me, uh, let me rephrase just a little bit. So I, I'm fortunate that I, I get to do a lot of different things. And, and to me, you know, don't tell, don't tell this, but I'm, I'm pretty average at all of them. And people will describe me as an inch deep and a mile wide. And I think they're talking about nothing. Anyway, <laughs> inch deep and a mile wide. And what I found is it's really relatively easy. And the people that I see who struggle, who have a hard time moving the ball forward, now this will sound counterintuitive, are perfectionists. Because if you are one of those, I have a close friend who is an inch wide and a mile deep. And he absolutely has to know it all before he'll take the first step. He's a banker and a lawyer by training. But I found, so in emergency medicine, I call it the 95% confidence interval. I've had colleagues who have to know the diagnosis when the person leaves. And they go through great, they, they, just, they, they do everything to learn. And they see one patient a day. And you just can't operate, or I personally cannot operate in any environment where I had to always be perfect. So if, you're, if you say, I'm gonna be the 95% confidence interval, I'm gonna embrace the mistakes when I make them, I'm gonna learn from them and move forward, change course of them and move forward, but I'm gonna build the wings while I'm flying. And, and that's how I think, at least in my own case, I've moved the ball forward. I'm very comfortable living in, with some ambiguity. 
not a ton of ambiguity because some of the stuff that I get to do is kind of life and death, but enough ambiguity that if I make a mistake, I can hopefully react quick enough that I can make those small course corrections and you can get back on the path. So if you're one of those people that's incredibly type A that you have to know it all before you take the first step, life's hard because it's hard to know it all. But if you can live with some ambiguity and you're not afraid to fail and your ego doesn't let you get so bruised up that, that you can't laugh at yourself, uh, God, it's really relatively straightforward. Did that answer your question? Answered another question. <laughs> it was close enough. Other questions? Well, you guys have been great. I've learned more from you than you, you have from me, and the lunch day was awesome. So thanks again for the service to our country. I'm, I'm awed. I'm, I'm proud as hell of you and of my son who's in the military. So thanks for the service, and thanks for being there. I really appreciate it. Thank you.